Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to FIBON Morning Talks. Uh, we are here at uh, FIBON's office and uh, FIBON Morning Talks is our monthly discussion that focuses on the latest topics in angel investors' minds. And in each session, we have uh, one uh, experienced angel investor or uh, industry experience sharing their knowledge with us. And uh, I'm here today with uh, Reima Linnanhirta, the board of um, the chair of FIBON's board and the, an experienced angel investor. So uh, warmly welcome, Reima. Thank you. And uh, my name is Johanna, I'm FIBON's training and development manager. And today's topic is lead angel compensation models. But before we dive into the topic of today, could you, um, although many of us are uh, familiar with your career and background, could you maybe, Reima, share a little bit about your background? Sure. So great to, great to be here today. And uh, yeah, of course, most of you know me as the chair of the board of FIBA and an active business angel, but as with many of you, this is just one of the careers. So before getting into this point, uh, I actually started my career in uh, accounting. Uh, my family all owned an uh, accounting firm and I was there basically already running around when I was a couple of weeks old. And uh, later I took that company over and when my father got ill, ran it for a couple of years. And in 2003, uh, I sold it to administer. Um, after that, uh, I finalized my studies, got a degree in laws and uh, moved on to big four consultancy, more working with taxation, structuring, M&A, and then, then Lehman Brothers happened. So the whole M&A market pretty much dried up. Mm -hmm. And I ended up doing refinancing and finance related work. Um, a few years, a few years later, me and my colleague were talking over lunch that actually the business model of the company we work for wasn't, wasn't the best one. We can do a better one. And then we started a company called Old Run Sound. So basically started to compete with uh, these big four consultants, EY, KPMG, Deloitte, and BWC. And we actually actually succeeded uh, quite well. So today, I think Older and Sound is fifth biggest tax consultancy in the month, very, very strongly in financial advisory, M&A advisor, and so on. Um, I exited myself from that company in 2015. And uh, of course, I had the idea that I think every entrepreneur does at that point that, okay, now I don't do anything. Well, that lasted for maybe four months. And uh, I had already been doing startup investing on the, on the side. So did my first investment, I think in 2012 or 2013. And uh, then I started spending more time with startups. And in the end of the day, uh, I actually started investing and one thing led to another. Uh, Pontus Stroman invited me to become a FIBA member. And as of today, I have over 20 plus companies. I think 24 is the actual account today. Uh, in my portfolio and pretty much full-time work with those companies. Yeah. And uh, you have also lots of experience in leading uh, syndicates, also uh, cross-border syndicates, um, which is the topic of today. Yeah. And we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of this session. So then everybody can ask all the, all the questions that they always wanted to ask, ask from you about leading syndicates. But uh, yeah, um, let's move on. And... Um, and uh, before we, uh, here's the uh, program. Uh, so we will have 25 minutes discussion and then we have the 50 minutes Q&A. And um, before we uh, dive into the uh, topic of today more closely, let's have um, uh, use Mentitool. And I have prepared one question, so uh, which we can ask also from our online audience. Um, so if you can all go to menti.com and the code, code that you can use is 4758256. So menti.com and logging with code 4758256. And the question is, what comes to mind when you think of the role of the lead angel? And uh, maybe, Reima, could you maybe share your own thoughts? What comes to your mind? Yeah, sure. So I, I think that it's actually fantastic to see that people start with adjectives. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you cannot define a role that is the starting point you need to define the roles because every syndicate is different every startup is different and the role of a lead angel can be different mm. but what combines those all is that there is the word lead mm. so so you are either leading the syndicate you are leading the deal you are helping to lead the company 
Yeah. So so that is the combining element, and I think that all the all the uh, words that I'm seeing are something that you would yeah. <laughs> would include in that one. Yeah, and there are many that fast, creative, uh, focus, bold. It goes so fast. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. many words. Yeah, what do you think? What's the most important? Yeah, I think uh, I think. The most important element, if you want to succeed as a lead, uh, it's always always comes down to that you need to build good working relationship with the between the syndicate members as well as between the syndicate members and the founders and between yourself and the founders. So, so in the end of the day, in order to do that, it's really about building trust, like everything in business. So, yeah. if you if you want to cooperate with somebody, you need to build trust to do it. Yeah. And uh, of course, in angel investing, is one of the things that is really the challenging one to do right is that at the same time uh, you are the one who is supposed to ask the tough care questions from the founders yeah. but at the same time they would need to want to have you to help them in the future mm -hmm. so so when you start asking these tough questions to do the due diligence properly mm -hmm. you need to also do it in a way that the founders find it more of a mentoring coaching and helping and not just constantly challenging and disputing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, seems like we have a very active uh, online audience today. And uh, let's use the same tool at the end of the, uh, the session. But now let's move on. And uh, so last week, Biban introduced the uh, lead angel compensation best practices. And today, today we can go through all of these. Um, but before we dive into this, um, um, could you maybe um, share what are the things affecting leading like leading to compensation? Yep. So maybe maybe to go a bit bit back. So why FIBAN board introduced these best practices? We've been talking about leading and developing leading a lot, and we have had launched several initiatives on that one. There is the new lead angel trainings. There's the NLO New Nordic Leads program. Uh, the VLP content for lead or oh, specific track for lead angels in the new online academy. And that is because we need more leads. And one, one uh, comment that we have had is that support the leads with lead angel compensation because uh, it might be, it's quite often is doing a lot of work. And at the same time, it's also driving the value of everybody's in investment. Uh, so in order to get people really do that and get the best syndicates and get the best results out, uh, it, it makes sense to incentivize them. Mm. But what we have realized is that we have communicated that, yes, you should compensate the lead. Uh, so we have had quite a lot of questions that, okay, how you should compensate. Yeah. And we have talked about the mechanisms, but we haven't yet given any uh, instructions as such, any numbers or guidelines or that. And that is basically what started this whole mm. best practices program. So, so as I said, it's a guideline. It's not anything that uh, we see that this is the way to do it. Mm. As I said, every syndicate is different, but at least give some kind of starting point. Yeah. So in my view, it's pretty similar to, for example, what we have with the sweat equity options. We have certain uh, best practices, certain guidelines, but I, of course, every angel agrees themselves what kind of sweat equity setups they are doing. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so then let's dive into this uh, template here on the screen. You can see yeah. um, see the template and uh, we can go each each of these one by one. So uh, on the first one, we have uh, in the investment piece has a full scope role. So what, what does that mean? Yeah. So first of all, all of these elements that we have, it's it's not on or off. It's that this is the scope or this is the scope. They are more on. This is more of a continuum. Mm. So you might do um, elements that are closer to full scope, but not exactly the ones, or a lot more closer to limited scope, but not exactly one listed. But just to give the idea that where might be the contribution level is. Mm. And uh, what we have defined as the uh, investment lead as full scope is that investment lead, meaning that you are leading the syndicate. So you are engaged by the syndicate. So as a distinction, there are some of the elements where uh, the lead is engaged by the startup. And um, as, as the name says, it's a full scope. Mm -hmm. 
So everything starting from coordinating the syndicate, uh, coordinating questions, coordinating due diligence, getting people in the same room, uh, uh, drafting, getting, getting the term seat on the table, negotiate that, uh, taking care of documents, taking care of the that the people actually pay the tickets. Mm -hmm. So basically being at the same time the single point of contact towards the founder, but also at the same time being the sort of a manager mm -hmm. of this group of investors. But that is just the phase one. Yeah. Then the more important in my view is the, is the phase two. Mm -hmm. So if it's a investment leader's full scope, mm -hmm. it means that you also drive the investment, drive the company after the investment. Mm -hmm. So whatever you agree between the syndicate, you are the one representing the company. You take a board role or an advisor role and really are actively building the company to the next level. Mm -hmm. And it's of course something that has to be agreed between the, between the syndicate that does this mean that, okay, you are the board member now from here to exit, or is it, for example, which is more aligned with the uh, with my thinking that it's until the next big investor, so for example, the next VC mm -hmm. comes in. So, so anyway, agreeing that, and that is of course you are doing a lot of a lot of work. Uh, so, typical uh, compensation model naturally is lead investor carry. Um, the level that we have seen is that you would have twelve percent carry after the return of 2x. Mm -hmm. So this is actually in line with what we have in Fib and Follow. Uh, we realized that that was pretty good baseline and also in line with the international standards. At the same time, it's uh, just for those who don't know how carry works, it basically means that uh, first, uh, uh, the investment, or in this case, 2x the investment, so twice the investments, is returned to the investors and only returns exceeding this one, the carry is paid. And in this case, it would be 12%. Mm -hmm. So also meaning that it has to be good investment. You have to be over 2x mm -hmm. in, in order to get it. And so it's, it's really results driven. And that way it also directs the angel to push this company forward. Yeah. So what about if the 2x is, is not, uh, uh, can there be also some board compensation? at the same time? Or? Uh, it, it's all, I said, all of these can be combined. All of these are as agreed. Yeah. But I, I would say that if, uh, this is more of the lead that promises to the syndicate members that I know this industry, I'm going to help this company to become a big one. Yeah. And then it's, I would say that uh, getting separate board compensation in that kind of setup is a bit contradictory mm -hmm. to that uh, thinking. Yeah, yeah. And then on the second one, we have their limited scope. And there's also lead in investor carry, but uh, yeah. 3%. Yeah, so this this is more on the, I would say that how it's commonly, the, of course, uh, one thing is that uh, leading is defined in so many different ways mm -hmm. that there's, there's not one way. I would take that this story would reflect our most common thinking of what leading is. So coordinating the syndicate, mm. uh, taking taking care of due diligence, once again, being the single contact point to the founder, mm. uh, ensuring that the deal is done, helping with the documents and so on. But the difference is that in this scope, it's not the angel's role to push this company forward, at least not alone. So for instance, this kind of setup uh, might work for both those syndicates, which uh, are rather passive, so nobody takes an active role. For example, the founders are so capable that you, they don't need support. Mm -hmm. Or it might be for those cases that all syndicate members have already agreed mm -hmm. how they will help the company. So, and if every investor's contribution is the same, mm -hmm. uh, there is not a similar need for the lead agent compensation as with the, with the full scope scale. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are basically the differences between the model one and two. Mm. And these two models, as I said, it's not this or this. These are continuum. So if you, uh, if you feel that the, uh, yes, there is one person taking this sort of a very active hands-on role, but at the same time, the other angels are also contributing, uh, it is something to be reflected here. Mm. Yeah. So let's talk about the 
talk a little bit more about this, like when the lead angel has an active, reactive role, how can the lead angel then um, use the syndicate members to help with uh, activities such as due diligence or... or yeah, uh, yeah, and I, I think that that is good to separate it in two parts. One is uh, pre-deal and one is post-deal. In pre-deal, I would say that the most important part comes that uh, if there is someone with deep industry experience, as there usually is, having this kind of per person helping in the due diligence. Mm. Uh, we have had several good examples in P-Bans indicates that, for example, we have had some really uh, deep IP that really needs to be understood. And at the same time, we have had uh, in investor who is specialized in that, like a, for example, professor in food technology, yeah. diving into that specific area. And that is of course, that cannot be done. And second is what I, what I do to my own background, see quite often that if there is a lawyer in the syndicate, you usually end up holding the pen when the paperwork is done. But then if it, when we look at the post deal side, I. Uh, there it becomes more interesting because all of us have network, all of us have different strength areas, and we can contribute a lot to the company. But at the same time, we need to keep in mind that not all of our members are looking to contribute. Some of our members want to just invest. Mm -hmm. Some don't have time. Uh, some don't necessarily, there might be conflict of interest with their current work. And uh, these different models, the model that you apply needs to uh, reflect all of this. Yeah. But but my advice, of course, usually is that the strength of an angel investors is that we can build a syndicate. There is a skill set of different people. And if they are willing to help the company as they usually are, it's more value than just bringing in the money. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's usually a wider network than, for example, with uh, if you get an a uh, VC investor or bank loan or uh, family office uh, funding. So so that is our competitive advantage and it most commonly, most often makes sense to use it. Hmm. Yeah. Um, then we have, um, so, the, so that the role of the ladies board member or advisor, advisory role, and there we have uh, the recommended compensation model is the uh, board member or advisor fee or sweat fee. Yeah, so it's, it's more of a, a sake of clarity kind of thing. So I would say that if you take a board role, if you take an advisor role, it uh, does not m mean that you are actually lead by definition. Yeah. But um, it might be, for example, that there isn't necessary need for leading the syndicate. Uh, it might be that the founder is doing it, or it might be that it's very straightforward case or, or smaller syndicate. But at the same time, uh, we have had uh, these questions coming coming out quite often that what is I appropriate board member compensation in a startup? And uh, that is basically why we wanted to add this baseline because these kind of situations come in. It might be that the investor is the only investor in the company, or it might be, as I said, that the founder has been taking care of the leading the investment process and it's more help on the, on the post deal side. Yeah. But once again, really depending them depending on how active the board member is and everybody sets their own prices mm. yeah um so then on fourth line there's uh raising the round so if the angel lead angel helps to raise the round and uh, there would the recommended compensation model is sweat equity and yeah and here i would underline that as i said beginning this uh two or three first mm -hmm. first that we went through were those ones that you were initiated by the syndicate. Mm -hmm. Now, this is more that you are initiated by the startup in, in raising the round. Mm -hmm. So that is that is a role that we see a lead uh, acting as a, well, might be that it's a uh, um, person who has previously invested in the company or somebody found an interesting company, but still need this. Okay, I will invest, but we need more money. I need to bring people in. Yeah. And uh, it's a, uh, uh, it's uh, I, I think that it's an activity that uh, quite quite many of our members are doing. It's quite commonly seen. But the, yeah, the key differentiator between uh, this one and the previous ones is that now you you are working for the startup. Of course, yeah, you are working on the syndicate as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I would say that this reflects more on the that it's closer to the limited scope syndication with the difference that now you are helping the company to find the investors. Mm. 
-hmm. whereas I would say that in the limited scope syndication case, you already have the interested investors in place. Yeah. So do you have, could you tell a little more maybe about this? Maybe you have some some stories well it's uh, I I think that every every investor who goes in early has this yeah. has this story already but yeah. it's a uh, so quite often we uh, help the companies uh, raising raising the raising the future rounds and uh, of course we have the connections we have the networks we know how the story should be told to the told to the uh, uh, founders and I would make a clear distinction uh, here that if you are if you are just uh, for example if the companies taking care of pitching, mm -hmm. taking care of contacting investors, prepared materials, uh, then, then you are closer to the final line. So that mm -hmm. uh, that basically the lead angel is only helping in this mm -hmm. process. But this is this is really about opening the doors, uh, uh, building up the short list of investors, making the connections, uh, participating actively in the investor meetings. Uh, I, for example, Pontus Stroman, uh, one of our previous vice presidents, uh, vice chairs has been um, he has this way pitched me one company, and uh, it's thanks Pontus. It was a great case. Mm -hmm. So, so it's also uh, we we act on both sides. So yeah. sometimes we have to act on the syndicate side. Sometimes we act on the startup side. And we need to keep those both in mind. Yeah. And then the last one, there's uh, the role of the helping helping the company in the round. So how is this different from the? Yeah. So, so as I said in the in the previous one, the most important part it was opening the doors, mm -hmm. and uh, this is more on that you help with the uh, materials, mm -hmm. uh, you help drafting the deck, and um, work, work, uh, work that some of us do quite many of us do pro bono, some of us do this as consultancy, and maybe just to highlight the difference in between between helping the company versus really being active active on the fundraiser. But the key, key differentiator for me is that whether, whether you are uh, bringing the investors to the table or whether you are helping to close those investors yeah. or are you just reviewing reviewing the materials. Yeah. But as I said, all of these five that we are looking now in mm -hmm. today, uh, these are not, a, this is the case. This is a continuum, yeah. there are different degrees and um, it depends on, one on the activity, the role, uh, the experience networks that the lead is mm -hmm. taking. It depends on the role of the other investors involved. Uh, it depends on the role that the startup and the founders are, are taking. And, and when you combine all of these, then then you can start to thinking about that where that is. But, mm -hmm. but as I said, the question that we have asked several times in trainings is that, is there a best practice mm -hmm. on the compensations? And now there is, yeah, yeah. And uh, maybe, maybe a couple of points because I, I try to answer questions that I will get already in, in, in the in the Q and A. Uh, if I if I look at my crystal ball, um, I uh, I don't want to go deep into technicalities, but all of these are doable. So if we talk about the carry, it's usually something that you would reflect in the shareholders agreement. Mm. Uh, you can you can do it in. Uh, basically using separate share classes if you want, but you don't need to. Uh, you can you can do it in the shareholders agreement as well, or, or you can do it in the syndication agreement. And when it comes to other compensations, like whether there's a board fee or so, it's, those are pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. So so from that point of view, these are also, also elements that have been, have been considered that how you implement those in practice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so how do you then yourself know which role you want to take in a company do you have any well for, for me it's quite uh, uh quite common that uh, if i invest in company i want to be hands-on mm. uh, of course realizing that at the moment i'm a bit difficult to take more investments dude because i don't have enough time yeah so i i like to lead and uh I like to find companies where I can see that, okay, I can help this company to reach, reach the next step. Yeah. Uh, but of course, that's, that's not for everybody. Uh, most of our members are not full-time business angels. Mm. So you cannot build a portfolio of 20 companies and be full-time on all of those if you have a full-time job mm. on the side as well, or then you are super effective. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it really, I would say that it really depends on the, on the, uh, a person what kind of role they want to take mm -hmm. and if the investment case is exciting enough. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think it was Pontus who said earlier that uh, the most the, the person who should lead the case is the one who is most excited about it. And I, I pretty much agree because uh, one, in order to get the deal done, there really needs to be somebody pushing it. Yeah. Um, at least it comes a lot faster. But the more importantly is that the best person to help the company is the one who really loves to see that succeed. Yeah. And in the end of the day, that is what leading should be all about. So helping the company to succeed, whether yeah. it's helping them to raise money or whether it's this full, fully flat scope, but all aimed at the same direction. Hmm. Yeah, we mentioned that uh, it's important that the lead angel is uh, very excited about the case, but how to then get the other syndicate members or collective syndicate members and get them excited about the case? Well, they, of course, they should be excited already yeah. from the start. Uh, you shouldn't look and look into a case that you are not excited about. Yeah. It's, uh, in my view, it's a waste of time. There are there are literally hundreds or even even over thousand companies looking for funding in team and deal flow every year. So use the time on the ones that you you get excited about. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I would say that it's more about aligning the interest and aligning the questions. So. Um, um, when you, when you have a syndicate of maybe half a dozen or more, it becomes that there are different views, for example, where the business should be going. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to end up in a situation that some of the investors want the company to apply a strategy A and the others want to apply a strategy B, mm -hmm. especially if the founder uh, is indecided yeah. between, between the options. And uh, I, I would say that it comes that you share the vision of the founder. Mm. So, so, or it, it might be some cases that you partly share it, but you can find the common ground mm. where it is. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's in the end of the day, if the case is good, you get excited. I wouldn't say that it's not necessarily leads role to get the other investors excited. Mm. But the lead role is to get this deal done and to help the company forward. Yeah, yeah, true. I, I agree. And uh, and one that I've heard is that it's important to have also same values because because that then also. Uh, but yeah, yeah, and I would say that today, ninety five percent of the startups that I see have some value driving it. That's maybe five percent who have either haven't thought of it. Or then they are just after money, yeah. but well, it might be value as well. Uh, but um, it's uh, when there are certain values guiding the company. Mm -hmm. If if the investors share those values, it usually becomes an exciting case for them. Yeah. And if they don't share, it's uh, not actually. You don't usually even look into that company. Or if you look, you look it from financial point of view. But then, um, then the difference between uh, having an angel investor or having just money becomes uh, becomes pretty much unclear. Yeah, yeah. And, and the time is flying. We have a, we can soon move on to the Q and A. Um, but maybe one question before that. Uh, so I mentioned in the beginning, or we talked that uh, you have also uh, experience in leading a cross border syndicate. So could you maybe share some of your experience? There. How many minutes we had? <laughs> no, it's um, it's um, at the same time, leading a cross border syndicate is no different than leading a domestic one, yeah. and at the same time, it's totally different. Yeah. So, not different meaning that we are doing the same things. So, we are collecting the interested investors, we are collecting the questions, we are doing the due diligence, uh, we are negotiating the deal. Everything in this sense is, is similar. Mm. But then comes that when you do a cross-border deal, for me, the biggest difference is that, uh, challenge is that you need to align different business cultures. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, actually surprising that you don't need to go far from Finland. But for example, one challenge that I run across quite often, and that's, that's my mistake, being, being Finnish, we have the highest level of trust in business. We can do business with people we don't know. And uh, if I start to do diligence in a Latvian or Lithuanian company where the business trust is high, but it's not as high, uh, getting the answers, getting the information, the Finnish founders usually give you a straight answer to a straight question. And in these situations that uh, you need to ask more tighter questions, you need to ask it more often. 
And um, this is not only between uh, investors and founders, but between investors as well. So if you have uh, international syndicate investing in Phoenix companies, you might, might find out that you might be taking a more relaxing approach on the due diligence than some other investors are doing. And this is reflected in any areas. Due diligence is just one example. Um, and second one is, of course, legal. So you always, in the end of the day, you always invest uh, with the rules of the country you are investing in. And um, I, uh, the uh, Finnish Companies Act is pretty straightforward when it comes to uh, getting, uh, getting an investment and issuing mm -hmm. shares. Uh, but when you enter in cross-border deals, you might find out that, for example, oh, I need to go to a notary to register mm -hmm. this investment. And I need to do it in person, in the country. Mm -hmm. or, or it might be that, so for example, just this week, uh, I got uh, from two different cases the same question. Sorry, but where are our share, share, share certificates? And uh, well, everybody, everybody who is born in the 60s or earlier mm -hmm. knows that yeah, we used to have share, share certificates in Finland, but yeah. we haven't used those like in, I think, uh, in 15 years yeah. when, it, when it hasn't been any more mandatory. So these kind of questions, mm -hmm. they are both cultural, legal related, are the ones that you really need to be prepared to do. And that, of course, means also that it takes more time, mm. really depending on the country. Uh, with the syndicates between Finland and Estonia, I've been able to do to be pretty quickly. Mm. And uh, there's uh, one syndicate to work uh, in Lithuania, which we have now worked for several months already. Yeah. So, so really, really can be yeah. deb depending on the case. And of course, the more different countries are involved, the more complex it gets. Both, especially from the cultural side, but also from the legal yeah. side. Yeah. So one thing, of course, that can help me is the networks and. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, I probably won't invest outside Finland without having a local angel involved in the syndicate. Yeah. It's just uh, it's uh, too difficult for me to uh, learn all the details to do things right both in terms of the legal aspects, as, but as well as the cultural aspects. Yeah. And at the same time, I think that we don't need to do it by ourselves. Yeah. So there are, uh, we have good cooperation with Estban, Danban, Latban, Litban, Angels Band. Uh, pretty much we have a sister angel networks we cooperate in every country. And uh, if they are not interested in that case, yeah. nobody is interested to joining it. Uh, even if you would be interested, to, maybe at least I would ask myself the question that do I really want to invest in this if those who know this know this uh, cu uh, uh, culture better or not? Yeah, that's true. There are many benefits uh, behind diverse syndicates. And I'm, actually, that was the last the topic of our last people morning talks session. Um, so diversity and inclusion. But now let's move on to the Q and A. Uh, so uh, let's use Menti survey tool and uh, let's see what kind of questions uh, our online audience have for you. And uh, so if you can go to menti.com and use the code 4758256. Okay. Um, so here, I believe these are also uh, related to the... Um, and the previous question that we had, so that's so that what. what so if this is all Q and A, these are very interesting <laughs> yeah. questions. <laughs> yeah, but it's also related to the uh, the previous question that we had. So that was the um um about the uh, what comes to mind when thinking of the role. Oh, well, then then this is something generic. Yeah, so there are very very good points. Um, but uh, I believe that you can still use the same, same, um, same uh, survey if you can uh, submit there your questions as well. Or then we can also use the chat. So both are, both are fine. I can open the chat and we can check the questions there. So if you can put, put your, all, all your questions in the chat that you have. Uh, or Rayma regarding a lead angel uh, role or lead angel compensation or, 
okay, now it seems that the Menti tool is working. So menti.com, 4758256. Well, maybe while we are waiting for the yeah. questions, um, maybe um, I could ask some questions that I have he have heard from uh, angels uh, about uh, building a syndicate. So how much time does it usually take to gather the syndicate together? It, it really depends. It really depends. So uh, there are several aspects. So one is that uh, whether you start gathering the syndicate on a case that is investment ready. Mm -hmm. So usually we are talking about founders who already maybe have taken previous investment round or have some other experience from previous companies how to raise, uh, raise the round. And therefore they can, uh, they know that uh, what is required and uh, um, what, is, what is required and uh, then are prepared. And then are cases where you really need to help to build the investment case. Mm -hmm. But I would say that as a ballpark, uh, the, we talk about may process from uh, that is measured in one, small, one month, two months, three months mm -hmm. is, is quite common. And uh, as a tip to founders, I usually say that prepare for the three months. If it happens in one month, it's good. Yeah. But um, anything, any, there are quite often details mm -hmm. that take time. Yeah. Okay, now it looks like that the uh, mint is working. So uh, our first question is, at its worst, can lead angel compensate and make other angels to be less active when they would have ability to help them? Excellent, excellent question. And uh, I, this is why I want to once again underline that when talking about lean digital compensation, agree the roles and responsibilities. Mm. So if you think about the full scope, it's really on those cases that there is one or maybe several leads that divide that. When it's several leads, they of course divide the uh, carry, which are taking more active role and uh, motors are taking more passive role. So it's already uh, when this indicate is set up, it's already discussed that yes, there will be more passive members. And once again, we need to keep in mind that we have syndicates of three, we have syndicates of 50. Mm. So of course, the setup, if, if uh, usually on those uh, cases where there's 50 people, they are not everyone active. Mm. Uh, so, but if, if every investor agrees to take an active role, then for me, it makes sense that you also, also agree that, no, there is no lead angel compensation. We are everybody chipping in with equal efforts. Mm -hmm. and, and then it's of course fair. Yeah. And then we have the second question is, uh, can syndicate members invest very different amounts or is it better to have a more similar size for each investor? Um, once, once again, good question. Um, of course, what we see in practice is that they are very, very different sizes. And uh, in my view, it makes sense uh, because uh, it enables that we can include more people. For some, it doesn't make sense to participate with tickets uh, smaller than 30K, for example, or 50K. And with some people, it's uh, if they want to diversify, they need to keep their tickets to 10K. Mm. And um, that, of course, creates benefit. But at the same time, it creates the situation that not all uh, investors are equally aligned with the interest. Some may have huge positions, some may have smaller positions. Mm. And uh, in those kind of cases, of course, if the one with bigger position is more active in the company, it, it makes sense. Uh, but if a, a someone with smaller position is the lead, uh, then of course, it's, I, would, I would say that it's interesting to everyone else to ensure that that lead is also, also aligned and reflecting that in the, in the compensation. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I believe we have some questions in the chat as well. Uh, is it topic in Finland that lead angels should make it possible for the syndicate to park partly exits in a later round, for example, in the A series? Uh, there's apparently somebody reading uh, reading my calendar on the online. <laughs> now, it's uh, this is actually a discussion that I have been having. And what we are actually seeing, seeing is uh, a while ago, a couple of years ago, VCs didn't in Finland by angels out in A rounds, for example. But now there's actually more and more these kind of cases happening. There's still the situation that we have VCs that the fund rules uh, forbid them uh, in, in participating in secondaries, but there are also funds that are allowed to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I think that from Angel's point of view, as well as from companies and VC's point of view, it would make sense. Uh, it would mean an earlier exit for the angels, because we all know that when VC comes in, it's a 10 year journey. So if you have already been in for the company for five years, it means that it's a 15 year journey for you. Uh, but the second also is that uh, for, both, for both the VCs as well as the company, having small investors in the cap table at that point when VC has already joined in, doesn't ne necessarily add value. It might be even quite the contrary. There are more people to keep informed. Uh, there are more people joining in decision making. And uh, this is actually something that uh, we want to address more to the VCs mm. that should you consider secondaries more often. Yeah. And then there's another question. So are there any statistics for lead angel compensation being used? Uh, not that I would call statistics, at least from Finland, we haven't collected this mm -hmm. systematically. When we did this um, uh, uh, guidelines that we presented, we basically reached out to several angels who we know that have been active in uh, tens of uh, startups and have seen different practices on different deals. But uh, it's uh, there hasn't been a uh, any any. I think that there has been several years ago one study by Fiban, but actually actually a good point and it could be actually added that this is something that we should look into into and see where things are going. Yeah, true. It will be very interesting to know who is uh, in the competition and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Looks like. Uh, we have now answered all the questions and the time is flying, so um, let's let's move on. I will uh, then shortly uh, tell us about our next uh, topic that we have uh, in January. Let's give a morning, morning talk, and, uh, and uh, we, sh we can go back to the slides if there are no... Oh, there's... Yeah. Mm, yeah. And so here we can see the upcoming sessions. So uh, today we talked about lead angel compensation models and in January, the topic will be impact behind angel investments. So uh, in January, Oscar Pierpont, our investment analyst will be here hosting the session. And, uh, and if you haven't yet checked, go check the data compass that can be found on our website. There are very interesting angel investing statistics. And, uh, and that's uh, and then the February March topic will be reviewed soon. And if we can move on, I will also tell us uh, tell a little bit about our new Nordic leads uh, lead angel training. So uh, for many of you, this is already probably familiar. Um, so this is a lead angel training and investment credit training uh, program put together by Ivan and Espan. And we will have the next lead angel training session in January uh, on this. 22nd. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, how to lead syndicates on or some like topics uh, related to um, any syndicates, so uh, join our new direct leads LinkedIn group and uh, you can also read more on the website on so newdirectleads.com. And uh, yeah, so that's all. all for now, so thank you very much for everybody. Thank you, Raymond. It was thank you. Uh, really great to have you here. And uh, thank you also for our active online audience. And have a great day, everyone. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful Christmas time. And uh, see you in January. Yes.